Hey, didn't we have a great time in here on Wednesday night during Tabernacle Prayer? Wasn't that, wasn't that powerful? Hey, man, had a good time. All right, open your Bibles to Numbers chapter 22. Y'all are looking at me like, hurry up and preach. You don't have it 22 minutes. I only have 38 points today, so we're good. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done in us. Help us. You sent me here right now with this word that is already spoken in the earlier services. God, let me get out of the way. And may they run into who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about Numbers 22 before we read verse number 18. In Numbers 22, we've been in this series called Supernatural. And all of our, our messages in this series have been about miracles or about angels. And this one kind of has a little bit of both. And you see, we get kind of wigged out and freaked out when we start talking about supernatural things, but yet we read a book that's all supernatural. The fact that this even exists is supernatural. Do you get that? That that many writers over that much time could write one book that flows seamlessly is totally supernatural. And so if we want God to interact in our lives, we're going to have to embrace the fact that we serve a supernatural God who wants to change who we are. And so we've been studying this, trying to figure out what the components of the supernatural are and what it means for us as believers. And this passage, really, I'm, I'm telling you, it has about 38 good sermons in it. I'm going to attempt to do a few of them today. In a hurry. No amens there at all? Some of you went, praise God, he's going to do it in a hurry. We're going to do a few of those in a, in a hurry. But let me give you the setting so you'll understand what's happened. The children of Israel, at this point, have begun the invasion. As they've begun the invasion, they're, they're, they're the, are moving forward. There's about four million of them. I want you to imagine what four million people would be like coming across the terrain. Four million wide. 90,000 is what goes to Neyland Stadium when Neyland Stadium plays a game. 90,000 people. Now take that and multiply it to 4 million. So imagine your favorite stadium doesn't even hardly begin to compare to what this looked like. They come across and everything is just wiped out. It reminds me of a few years ago. We did an egg hunt and we had 10,000 eggs. It took us hours to put out 10,000 eggs. I mean hours. And I watched a few hundred children line up and we said go. And in about 45 seconds, it didn't look like a vacuum cleaner. I wanted to cry. I wanted to stand there and enjoy it, but it just wiped it out. Could you imagine four million people, how it, what the land must have looked like when they came through? Four million. They come and they battle the children of Ammon and they wipe them out, just slaughter them. They then go to Bashan and Bashan is wiped out. And so then they end up, uh, they're coming into a place called Moab. And Moab, uh, their king's name is Balak. And Balak says, there, this is not cool. This isn't going to work. There's no way in the natural that I can beat them. So Balak says, I'm going to have to beat them in the supernatural. So he goes and he finds this, this prophet named Balaam. And he sends Balaam all of this gold, and he sends him all of these treasures, and he says, look, I want to bless you with all this, but you've got to come, and you've got to curse the children of Israel. And Balaam says, I can only do what God tells me to do. And, and, and he says, I can't come with you. God says no. So they, Balak sends them back with even more stuff. And Balaam says, look, I told you God says no. And that's where we're going to pick up in verse number 18. And I want to read it with you this morning. Then Balaam answered and said to the servant of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold. Notice this. I could not go beyond the word of Jehovah my God. Who's God? His God. Who's, who are we talking about? Balaam. Balaam has been sent out. He said, I can't do more than my God, Jehovah, I can't do less or more than he speaks. Now, I think this is really, really important for us because I want you to notice that they're asking him to curse the children of Israel who are known as the children of God. They're the children of God. And here Balaam says, God, is, the living God, Jehovah, is my God. And they're on opposite sides of this situation. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but sometimes you can end up on opposite sides uh, against people that also love God. You can end up in an argument with somebody who they love God also. 
You know what I'm talking about? Pastor Danny apparently had a moment like that yesterday. I'm going to tell you. I remember one specific argument in my family because my wife and I both love God, but sometimes we end up on opposite ends of a moment. I know that may surprise you. This one little lady came to me in my early at my pastor, and she said, do you argue with your wife? I said, oh, yes. She said, well, I'll never come to your church. I said, why? She said, I couldn't imagine a pastor arguing with his wife. I said, then you'll never go to any church with a married pastor. <laughs> but my wife and I, we were having one argument. I'll never forget this particular day because I'm just going to be real plain on this. And she, she was in the last service, so I can be a little bit plainer in this service. Than that. She was wrong. <laughs> I'm telling you, I remember this day specifically because I was 100% right and she was 100% wrong. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not being silly. I was right. Because she wasn't mad at me. She was mad at somebody else. And I was telling her what God's word said about the moment. And she looked at me and stuck her finger at me and said, don't you preach at me. <laughs> and I was like, look, and we had fought, uh, fought and fought over this. And so we had to leave. And I was like, you're not going to do that. You're going to behave. You're going to honor God's word. You're going to do what's right. And she's like, don't you tell me what to do. And I'll do what I think I need to do. And I mean, it was, it was really, really a moment. A little fiery redheaded woman of mine. So we get in the car. Now, from my house to 400 is about a fourth of a mile. Okay? Down the driveway, up the, up the road to 400 is about a fourth of a mile. So I'm thinking, all right, we've got a short drive where we're going, and, Lord, I need you to move. So I just did what I thought I needed to do. I just started praying. I started praying, God, you're going to have to help her see what your word says here. You're going to have to deal with her in this. And, and I, you know what? I'm going to be real plain. I was praying internally. Okay, I wasn't going, God, help this woman you've given me. I was praying internally. And we get from my driveway to 400, and this is what my wife does. You remember this? She goes, stop praying. It hits me. I said, what? She said, you're over there praying, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, I'm praying. She said, I know you're praying because God's getting a hold of my heart over here. You see, we were on opposite sides of the moment. Sometimes you end up on opposite sides of the moment with the people you love, the people who are in church with you, the people that all, they love God also, and you end up on opposite sides of the moment, and there's a great little truth here that will help you. Are you ready for this? He says, look, I can only do what the word of the Lord that comes to me tells me I can do. I know the only way that I can go forward is to obey God in my life. And if I can't obey God in what I'm about to do, then I can't do it. You know what? I have made that point in three services, and the amen has been weak in all three services. Could it be that this is a message we need? That we need to get to the place that even if I feel very strongly about what I want to do, if it puts me in wrong standing with God or with others and causes me to violate His Word, then I have to stop. I can't do what I want to do if it causes me to violate God's Word. And so the beauty of this moment, and there's a whole lot of messages, like I said, this is number one of 38. There's a whole lot of sermons in here. And, and what he's saying is, I can't go outside of God's Word. His confidence is in God's Word. What would happen if we, as born-again Christians, got that much confidence in God's Word? I can't do it unless God's Word says I can do it. I'm not going to try to change the moment unless I know that God tells me this is what I'm supposed to do. Pastor Don, I, I'm so mad at my spouse, I don't know what to do. How about let a soft answer turn away wrath? Oh, that's not fun. Here's this. My neighbor's doing me wrong. How about this one? Do good unto those that despitefully use you. Ooh. Oh, y'all looking at me like, Pastor, we want you to preach on something else. And this is what Balaam says. I can only do what God's Word says I can do. And so that provides a safe place to be. I want to encourage you to have confidence on what God's Word says to do. Now, let's move on with the story of Balaam because there's about 37 more sermons here in. And I want you to see that in verse number 20, uh, what verse number 20 says. And let me also say this, Jeremiah 112, I don't want to miss this. The Lord says, I am watching over my Word to perform it. God's guarding His Word. But look at verse number 20. Verse number 20 says, That night God came to Balaam and said, 
Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but only do what I tell you to do. I want you to notice that. Go with them, but only do what I tell you to do. So, so the question here, I, I mean, ended up with kind of a conundrum here. Uh, I, I don't understand this. I, 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 they say this, but then they do this, and God tells him not to go, and he says, well, I can't go, but then it, it says, he says, God says, go. Now, this is how I found an explanation for that without studying the Jewish side of this. Here's what verse 19 says. They come back to him, verse 18, he says, I can only do what God told me to do, but verse 19 says this. Verse 19 says, but why don't you stay here tonight and let me talk to God about it. Let me try to negotiate with God about what he said. Now, see, that may seem strange to you, but I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I'll never forget, I'm in first grade, and I want to do something that seems perfectly normal to me, but it was against something that my church believed. And so I went to my parents, and I said, hey, I want to do this. And my parents, being great parents they were, they looked at me, and they made a real simple thing. They said, well, so why don't you go talk to God about that? Because, you know, we don't believe in that. And why don't you go talk to God and see what God has to say about that? So my little first grade self walked to my room, got down on my knees, and I prayed to God, God, I want to do this. God, I need you to let me do this. God, I know we believe this way, but God, God, this is not going to mess me up, God. This is not going to hurt me. I can handle it. First grade prayer. I come back out. I didn't say anything to my parents. Finally, my mom, I guess, curious. She said, well, did God talk to you, son? I said, yes, he did. She said, what did God say to you? I said, he said I could do it just this one time, just one time. And you know, that's silly. But that's the way we live our lives. You can get away with it just one more time, right? You know, you're the exception to the rule. You know, God's Word lays out some clearly defined parameters for relationships. God's Word lays out some clearly defined parameters for honesty and integrity. And we're wanting to negotiate with God. Maybe this was for an earlier service. Or could it be for us? We're wanting to get excused from the rules of this book just so, because, you know, it's what we want, God. And you see, that's what the Jewish people teach about Balaam here in this moment, why God said you can go. The reason they teach this is here's what they say. They say that Balaam lost sight of obeying the word of God, and he got his eyes on wanting to curse Israel because he wanted the cash. He wanted to go against what God said because it was going to make him have all of his dreams come true. How many of you know when you try to make your dreams come true outside of God's plans, it usually ends up a nightmare? And that's where Balaam was headed, into a nightmare. That in the end of this book, Balaam's one of the most cursed men, not somebody in love with God, but one of the most cursed men in the book of Revelation. It brings it all the way down. And here's what we see. He lost sight of the purpose. Now, back to our story. Where does the real side of the supernatural come in? Well, it really starts in verse number 21. God has now told him to go. And then so the next morning, he gets up. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. God told him to go, not to go, then told him to go. Now God's standing in the way. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. So here, so obviously you have a donkey and an angel, the supernatural Angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. She turned off to the road into the field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Verse 24. Then the angel of the Lord stood in the narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, notice this, she lay down under Balaam. And he was angry and he beat her with his staff. Okay, well, here's what we have is ancient road rage, okay? Here we go. Then the Lord, notice this, gave the donkey the ability to speak. And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me three times? I mean, you understand, that's supernatural. 
the donkey starts talking. Here's the freakiest part of the scripture right here. Balaam answered the donkey. I mean, that's pretty rough. Balaam responds. How many of you, if your dog looked up you and said, I just really wish you'd get me a different kibble? Most of you would be like, back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Balaam answers. He says, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Now, now, who would kill a talking donkey? You would be richer than you could be rich with a curse. Well, the donkey said, Am I not your own donkey, which you have ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn, so he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? Have I, I have come here to block your way because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now. But I would have spared her. Balaam confessed, notice that, to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to block my way. Now, if you are displeased, watch this, I'll go back. Lord, I'll change course to do whatever it takes to please you. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. And I tell you, we get caught up with a few things here. One is an angel in a path. Two is a talking donkey. But neither of those are the greatest miracles. The greatest miracle in this moment is a God who will lock the path of one that loves him headed toward destruction. That blows my mind. That God would take time to block our path. Some of the greatest miracles of your life, I want you to listen to me, some of the greatest miracles of your life were miracles that frustrated your path. They stopped you from going the wrong way. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I've been in one of those moments to where I was throwing a fit because we weren't moving as fast as I thought we should be moving. But when we arrived at the time we would have arrived, we would have been dead in that accident. I'll never forget that morning that I told you about just not too long ago when the tornado hit up in, in hell. And I was so angry because I'm not the type of person to run out of gas. My, my wife, she always hears the little ding and she says, okay, you've got 100 miles to go. And I'm like, no, that means we're already late. It's not my nature. I was so angry that morning that we had run out of gas. And when I turned that car around, I, I was so frustrated. But it was one of the greatest blessings of my life because we would have been in an overcrowded vehicle and we would have been literally behind the car that was picked up by the tornado. That was a miracle from God. I'm thankful that we have a God who even deals with hard-headed North Georgia people. Come on now, let me get an amen for that. And he puts angels in our path. He puts his presence before us and he says, look, don't go that way. I'm guarding you. I'm protecting you. He, he puts you. He lines up your life. Does anybody understand what I'm trying to tell you today? We have a God who does the greatest miracle of all. And it's not that some talking beast and some angel standing in the way. It's the fact that God loves us enough that he stands in our way. Now let me move on to that sermon two from the message. Sermon three from the message is the the story of how we see this. What do we always do? We always try to imagine, okay, I'm Balaam in this moment, and I know, I mean, I've, been, I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've been places I shouldn't have been. I, 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 I've headed directions I should not have headed. I mean, have you been there with me? Can I get an amen somewhere in this place? Okay. Well, you just talk about me. Yeah, you've been some, you know, not playing. But we've all done things we shouldn't have done. And we put our, ourselves in Balaam's shoes. But could, for a moment, could I challenge you to step out of Balaam's shoes and put yourself in the donkey's hooves. Because I believe the best example in the story is not Balaam, but the donkey. But some of you need to be the donkey. Thank you. Somebody in the last service kind of pointed at their spouse and said, well, they already are. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you need to be the donkey. The donkey was willing to lay down to push against, 
to fight against the road to destruction. The donkey loved the owner. Balaam's donkey showed concern for the owner. And, and, and so I tell you, you you've even bragged about how hard-headed you are. Come on now. You just, just certain signs. You'll just talk. Somebody, I had a staff member ask me one time, how in the world do you lead so many hard-headed people here in North Georgia? And I'm like, you just have to be more stubborn than they are. But you listen to me. We need people who will take that stubborn streak, as it were, and plant their feet and make a decision, my family will go to hell over my dead body. But pastor, if I say something to them about their way they're living, they, they, they might not come for the holidays. Holidays pass. Hell is forever. So you need to be the donkey. Now look, don't you dare take this sermon out of context. Don't you go home today and be grumpy and, and say, I'm just being the donkey. But you plant your feet. You look your children in the eye if you have to and you say, I'll help you with every step you make toward God, but I will not help you one step away from the presence of God. You determine that they might rise up and curse you now, but later they will call you blessed because you've made up your mind. You've determined I'm going to serve God and you are going to serve God and I'm not going to give in. He will come to me and say, Oh, Pastor, I'm all upset. Pray with me. Pray with me. My, my in-laws, I mean, my, somebody in my family has moved in with, with somebody they're not married to and it, I know this isn't God and I'll say, I'll pray with you as long as you're not paying the rent. I'll never forget one day. I, I, this wasn't in my sermon earlier. I was out one day, somebody, I pulled out and somebody said, Pastor, Pastor. And they waved me down to the parking lot. I said, hey, how are you? And they said, Pastor, I'm homeless. I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, let's deal with that. They said, Pastor, can you really help me? I said, well, tell me your circumstances. They said, well, I've been sleeping over in Dawson Forest. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I, don't you have family in coming? Yes, I have family in coming. I said, well, well, why aren't you with your family? And they said, well, they won't let my boyfriend come. I said, what'd you say? They won't let him come. So you told me he's got you sleeping in the car. Tell his sorry tale to hit the curb and you go home and repent. <laughs> but pastor, I love him. Stop. Get out of it while you can. Pastor, that's me. Yes. It's called tough love. Tough love. If he hits you while you're dating, tell him to hit the curb. I'm serious. We need to become stubborn forces in the lives of our children. I'm just worried my child might be looking at something bad. Take the phone away for it from them. Look at what they're looking at. You pay for it. Get involved in their lives and be the donkey. <laughs> Pastor, they might, not, they might not think I trust them. You don't trust them. That's what you're dealing with inside. Am I making sense? Somebody go home and say, I'm just obeying the word of the Lord. I'm being the donkey. Good. It would be better for them to rise up and curse you now than to stand on the day of judgment and say, why did you not help and rescue me? Be the donkey. And I close with verse number 35 this morning. Verse number 35, the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. Now, this passage is really, really odd because God tells him in the beginning, don't go. Then he says, God, can't we work something out here? And God says it sort of like this. Well, go ahead then. You know, I always realized that when my dad would say, don't, don't, don't. And finally he said, well, try it. It meant you're going to pay for it if you do. So that's kind of the way God said, well, go ahead then. So then God prepares to, to slay him. He's, he's spared by the donkey in his life. And then God tells him through the angel, watch this, now go. Don't go. Go. You shouldn't have gone. Now go. What is, what's that about? Watch what happens here. He said, I'm going to honor God. Then he started negotiating with God, and then he went on the wrong path. But the Bible says he fell to his face, and he repented. 
he declared, I have done wrong and I have sinned. And when he repented, watch this, his attitude changed. He got his eyes off the cash and he got his eyes back on God. He ends up going and proclaiming the three strongest prophecies over the nation, one of them that out of you, Judah, shall come forth a star, a scepter. This is the very prophecy that the wise men would follow. He gives three great blessings because, watch this, his attitude and his heart have changed. And because his attitude and his heart have changed, God can now use him in this situation. Here's what I want you to get. God's less concerned about where you're headed and he's more concerned about who you're becoming. Are you becoming someone God can use? Are you building your life here in his word? Would you stand with me? God is good to us. He has sent us a guidebook. He has sent us a mirror. I don't know how many times I open this book to read in the morning and I come across something and, 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 and it just deals with right where I am. It cleans me out. I go, God, I don't want to deal with that today. And he's like, son, deal with that to now. And I begin to trust him. And as I begin to line up with this, he determines more the success of my life. I remember asking God one time about something for our church. I said, God, what do you want us to do? Just tell me what you want us to do. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, but God, I want to know what you want. He said, what do you want to do? And I realized that God was saying, neither choice is really wrong, but, but, but what do you want to do? And I'm like, Lord, I want to please you. What if every decision of your life began to change so you had to ask yourself, are the decisions I'm making now pleasing God? Bow your heads I guess that's a good question for you. Is the way that you're interacting with other people on the other side of a conflict in your life, is it according to the word? Do you have God somehow standing in your way right now and you're frustrated because you know what you're wanting to do and you know it's not God's plan for your life? You know it's God's, not God's will for your life? Is there somebody in your life you need to be the donkey for? You need to stand up and fight if necessary? If you're not, I'm not going to help you go to hell but I'll help you every step towards Jesus. Is there somebody in your life that you are someplace in your own life that you say, God, I know you're, you're frustrating my path because you're trying to change who I am? With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, in moments this service will be a thing in the past. But I want to ask you, if you're here and any one of those points has spoken to you today and you know that God's dealing with your heart, can I see your hand right where you are? Would you hold it up high? Dozens and dozens of you. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. You can put it down. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. I'm going to ask God's word to take root in your life and change who you are. Today, right where you are, right here, right now, I want to ask some of you a very, very specific question. You're here and you've never changed course. You've been headed in the wrong direction, you know, your whole life. God's blocked your way time and time again. You know that you should have been killed in that accident, or you know that you shouldn't have survived that moment of mental breakdown, or you know that you, this, you were going to take your life and this happened. I mean, whatever it is, God's blocked your path over and over and over and over again because he wants you to know him as your father, as your savior, as your protector, your deliverer. With no one looking around and everyone praying in this room, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to change course. I've never changed course. I, I've been on the wrong road. But today I want to turn toward God. I want to repent. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. If that's you, can I see your hand right where you are? Would you hold it up? Hold it up high just like these others did this morning. Hold it up high. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others that would join? Thank you. There's three. Thank you. There's four. Are there others? Today's the day. God's going to change your life right where you are. Lord, I want you to join hands with someone near you, if you would. We're going to pray a simple prayer. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we would be born again. And God's going to start changing, 
changing that direction. It's not by accident you're here. I'm telling you, I feel God now. Somebody, you're that sheep that he's come after. He's put you in his arms now. You can feel that. You, you don't understand what's happening inside of you, but that's the presence of God as he's about to change your life. And we're going to pray this collectively with you. And, and I want you to pray this prayer of faith. And the Bible says that, that it's that, that prayer of faith that saves the sick. And it's this prayer of faith that's going to save your soul in, by the hand and grace of Jesus Christ right now. Come on, let's pray this prayer. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promises. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I give you my past, my present, and my future. I repent. I will not be the same. All that I have, I give to you. In Jesus' name, I believe he came for me. He died for me. Now he lives for me forevermore by faith from this moment forward God is my father heaven is my home and Jesus is my savior father for those that prayed that prayer for the very first time today I thank you God for what's happening in them and those that have prayed it as a point of rededication I thank you for what's happening inside of their lives God I ask you now by the power of the Holy Spirit God, that what has been begun in them, that you are sealing, you are, you, are, you are beginning to line up their life, Lord. And as they now take steps with you, met them right where they are, you're going to begin to move inside of them to make them who you created them to be, the highest and best form of themselves. Lord, for everyone that's here that's raised their hand that said, there's something in this message, somebody needs to be the donkey. Give them the fortitude, give them the backbone to be the donkey. Let them stand for their family, Lord, and you deliver their family. Give them the promise of the Philippian jailer as that he and his entire household were saved. Father, I pray, God, for those who know of a specific area that, that you're blocking their way. God, I thank you for the delivering power of the Holy Spirit and the victory that comes through Christ. Set them free. And, Lord, I thank you for what you've begun in this place. You're going to finish. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God a praise today.